everyone, how are you? Welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, welcome for the first time. I'm glad you could make it. Today, I'm going to talk about the explosive legal battles between ex-husband and wife Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. The recent defamation trial between them in Fairfax, Virginia has long been over, but the dust has not settled. Johnny Depp's career has gone back on track. He's performing in gigs in London and Los Angeles has taken selfies with fans that have run into him on his outings, signed autographs for them after a concert as seen in this brief clip. Hey Johnny! Hey Johnny, stop my head! And he shared the stage with singer Rihanna on her Savage X Fenty show. He's never been happier. Amber Heard, meanwhile, is staying on the cast of Aquaman and The Lost Kingdom with film producer Peter Saffron backing her up, and she has landed another role in a lesser known film. Her circumstances are looking gloomy. Her ex-husband has been rewarded $15 million in damages, while Amber's was $2 million. Both have filed separate appeals for the ruling, but Amber's assignment of errors is so wordy and erroneous that what could happen when they present their briefs to the Virginia Supreme Court is enigmatic. Two licensed lawyers that make commentary videos about ongoing high-profile legal matters on YouTube, Captain Lozado and Andrea Burkhart, have uploaded several educational videos to their respective channels where they examine the appellate rules and determine if Amber's assignment of errors fulfills what Virginia Supreme Court is expecting. Catherine concluded that Amber's appeal might get dismissed while Andrea argues that despite insufficiencies in her assignment of errors, she might be given an opportunity to correct these mistakes. They used Amber's and Johnny Depp's assignments of errors as visual aids to go over how the appeal process works step by step with the new rules in place. They don't let their personal feelings get in the way and they don't take the situation and the unsealed documents at face value. They're really, really fantastic attorneys. They are well versed in the profession so I trust that they know what they're talking about. I'll be linking their videos in the description along with my other sources. I strongly advise you to check them out to get a feel for what the new rules are like if you decide to appeal a ruling made in favor of or against you in court, but just a fair warning, the videos should not be construed as substitutes for seeking legal advice, and each state has their own rules for filing appeals. Handfuls of people on social media, institutions, and multinational conglomerates are still sticking by Amber Heard. Contrary to evidence and eyewitnesses saying her claims don't line up with what actually happened. One fan includes an ableist, biphobic YouTuber, Mage, aka Black and White Thinking, that predictably went into conniptions when I uploaded a couple of videos where I critiqued one of her own, shared what I learned from my conversations with friends I made that have borderline and narcissistic personality disorders respectively, and reacted to this woman's general behavior on Twitter. YouTube, fortunately, deleted a comment where she claimed I'm obsessed with her so I didn't see it until a couple months later on the YouTube Studio app, and it didn't show me the whole comment, but basically she hasn't changed a bit, and I'm starting to notice a pattern in her behavior. She also wrote an article that got published while the trial was still ongoing about why Amber Heard inspires her, which I read, and big surprise! It's literally for the same reason everyone else supports her. The article was self-admitted by its author to be written in the same tone as Amber's op-ed for the Washington Post, except the glittering generalities, cherry pickings, and muckraking are plainer in comparison. I discovered that prior to getting suspended from Twitter a second time, that's no surprise, Mage drew ire from a caregiver by allegedly wishing dementia on Johnny Depp. The tweet is thankfully gone, but the caregiver's reaction upset me because an uncle had Alzheimer's.
before he passed away last year, it gradually got to a point where he couldn't walk, he couldn't speak, and his sense of self deteriorated. The last time I saw him was at a Christmas party, and when I went to go look for him, he was confined to his bed. He was barely aware that I was in the room. Looking at him in that state was too much for me to bear, so to see Mage make light of people living with it got me to definitely stop being magnanimous to her. Mage had a row with another bisexual woman over Amber Heard on Twitter that was also a deal breaker for me. I mentioned this in my last video where I talked about the case, but it bears mentioning again so we know where I stand on this. So what happened was that Mage tweeted 10 captions that contained statistics regarding violence against bisexual women and women in general. The captions used Amber's likeness and that prompted this person to reply, As a bisexual woman, I want to say this very clearly. Just because something is likely or more common does not mean it happened here. These statements are true, but I resent the use of heard with them. Truth is facts and proof, not allegations. And then this happened. Sorry, you're complicit in your own oppression. Your brain isn't fully formed, so like normal, hope you get there. This is disgusting! After I looked into it, I decided to tell myself that her cruel comments don't mean jack. I've been called worse by my ex and in my line of work as an admin on two fandom wikis as well as a content moderator on a third. Trust me. Whatever! In this video, we have bigger fish to fry because I discovered that Vogue magazine published a similar article on its website around the same time saying, enough is enough. We've got to believe Amber Heard. It's a lopsided piece written by someone whose perspective is based on the backlash on social media directed at Amber as opposed to the trial itself. It makes it entirely about women's rights coming under attack when Amber's lying and public opinion of her has made it far more difficult for them to report their abusers. You can also make the jury's verdict about how flawed and patriarchal the legal system in the United States is, which it definitely is, there's no doubt about that. But nobody was charged with a crime. Defamation is a civil dispute that results in the victim receiving compensation for business and income they've lost after a false statement has been written or spoken about them. It's difficult to prove defamation occurred because it is protected by the First Amendment. The more effort a victim puts into fighting the statements that harm them, the costlier it's going to be to prove the perpetrator knowingly produced them beyond a reasonable doubt. Johnny Depp asked for $50 million while Amber Heard asked for $100 million in her countersuit, but neither of them was rewarded the requested amount. The jury was made up of middle class citizens that cannot relate to having millions of dollars to their name, nor can they afford an impressive real estate portfolio so it would affect their verdict. They were asked by the court only to determine if Amber Heard wrote her op-ed for the Washington Post with the intent to damage Johnny Depp's reputation, which she did. Raven Smith, the writer behind the Vogue article I'm going to look over, has botched the story by making it about the world's compliance with cyber harassment directed at Amber just for coming forward. Where to begin with the online cesspit that is Depp versus Heard? Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few weeks, you'll know that the ex-spouses are back in court. Johnny Depp is seeking damages of $50 million after Amber Heard wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post in 2018 in which she spoke of being a victim of domestic abuse, without ever explicitly naming Depp, but his legal team argued that she implied she was talking about him. The minuetty being combed through at the trial has come to feel less like a lawsuit and more like a torturous exorcism of the past, a thorough and painful raking over the coals of their four-year entanglement. The details of both Depp and Hurt's testimonies are harrowing all by themselves, gruesome, violent, and containing deeply intimate anecdotes about the relationship. Broadly speaking, witness testimonies can be persuasive, and with two actors in the dock, we can never be sure of the absolute truth. Still, despite the fact that London's High Court previously found allegations that Depp was a white beater to be substantially true, the internet appears to be have overwhelmingly picked Depp's side. Last week, hashtag Justice for Johnny Depp was trending on Twitter yesterday. It was hashtag Amber Turd. Real quick, I don't support anyone calling Amber that name. If you're going to do that, just don't. Though, it's, it's strange and unproductive in determining what the actual issue is. Although the Nick 
Although I understand that the nickname originated from a time Amber allegedly defecated in Johnny Depp's bed, I don't think calling her by that name is going to make her seem more like a villain. Just saying. I just need to get my thoughts on the UK libel case out of the way, but the first thing that immediately pops into my head is that the sun is a tabloid. None of the evidence presented at the trial, nor what Johnny Depp's ex-girlfriend have said about him, backed up what Dan Wharton had written in this article on my right. One old flame, Vanessa Paradis, who is also the mother of his children, Lily Rose and Jack, penned a letter to TMZ in 2016 that he is a sensitive, loving person that has never physically abused her and that Amber's allegations against him are nothing like the man she spent 14 years with. Kate Moss, a model Johnny dated in the 90s before he met Vanessa, testified during the 2022 trial that he never pushed her down the stairs, contrary to Amber's claim that he did, so it is a no-brainer that the son calling him a wife-beater is, in fact, slanderous. It's the same publication that intruded on Prince Harry's privacy by publishing nude photos that were taken of him in Las Vegas from a phone by paparazzi. Then managing editor of The Sun, Dan Dinsmore, stated that The Sun thought long and hard about publishing the photos and elaborated that its mission is about freedom of the press. Not really. The photos, after all, were a test of Britain's free press as written in an editorial, but putting celebrities under that much scrutiny is an enormous problem. Following them around when they're trying to live a normal life and filming them in a hotel room is not what I'd call freedom of the press. If we're following that distorted interpretation of that philosophy, then celebrities don't have any freedom. Not all of them dedicate their lives to public service, nor is it our regard to know what pizza topping they may or may not enjoy. When former UK Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott said that The Sun had shown absolute utter contempt from the law, and that Justin Bieber said that his fans make him feel like a zoo animal, they were both correct. Bieber's music may not be my cup of tea, but what I learned from him is that no amount of fame should come with sacrificing what you do with your private life over. The Sun's homepage is clickbait heavy. Captions for articles are full of eye-catching photos and cleverly worded headlines that arouse intense emotions from a gullible audience. Articles about a celebrity hitting rock bottom in their personal lives are tactless and one that features a 45 second video tutorial about how to make $3,000 a month by watching Netflix is misleading. I checked. Justice Andrew Nicole, who has since retired, allowed The Sun to stand by its fallacious comments because the High Court ruled that Amber's allegations against Johnny were correct, despite overwhelming eyewitness testimony saying that the claims may have been faulty. The Intelligence UK reported that Nicole's decision was the result of his personal relationship with Dan Watoon himself, in addition to having written a book, Media Law, with a lawyer that later went on to mentor Amber Heard's legal counsel. The outcome was a shocker that still boggles my mind to this day because, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, defamation isn't a criminal offense. Second of all, what's weird about the outcome is that Johnny Depp lost his major roles in the Fantastic Beasts and Pirates of the Caribbean franchises. Yet Amber Heard is allowed to remain on the cast of Aquaman in its upcoming sequel. Johnny Depp was made a social pariah all because The Sun, a publication that has notoriously breached ethics of journalism, decided to use a sensationalized phrase to increase traffic on its website and profit off of domestic violence. It's all in the name of freedom of the press. They're BFS with the ex-judge, so have some bonus points for holding that much sway in the courtroom, Mr. Martoon. From Warner Brothers' point of view, they were trying to separate themselves from an alleged abuser, so it would be fair to cut off ties with Johnny Depp. 
However, both Amber Heard and Ezra Miller have had run-ins with the law this year. Ezra is looking at up to 26 years in prison for burglary in Vermont, and Amber has been slammed with an inquiry from Australia's Department of Agriculture, Water, and Environment, with the FBI now joining in, for illegally bringing her dogs to the country in 2015. Warner Brothers has not said a word about the aforementioned situations. I talked to a friend about it and she said it would make sense for them to be quiet about the situation so they wouldn't face additional backlash after Johnny announced on his Instagram story that they asked him to resign from his role as Gala Grindelwald. But then again, 2022 was not kind to the company. Go on social media and the anti-her sentiment is fallible. The memes have been ferocious, something consisting of a spot the difference comparison with domestic abuse victims. At other times, televised courtroom footage has been appropriated to openly mock her appearance. It is plain misogyny. The company behind the makeup company Heard used to hide her bruises even made a TikTok disputing her claims. Heard is being systematically jeered at and ridiculed like a medieval criminal in the stocks as she catalogs historic abuse, as she alleges rape. Have we completely lost track of the severity of these allegations? Trigger warning for SA assault and, and intimate violence because Amber Heard's testimony in this part is graphic. Just to give you a fair warning, just a fair warning. No one has forgotten about it. The gravity of the accusations against Johnny Depp are still dire and should of course be taken seriously, but they're not believed because people that worked closely with him and Amber Heard couldn't find any proof that she was as seriously harmed as she said she was. Metadata found from photographs of her injuries published from TMZ revealed they were taken long before the dates of these incidents had taken place. Maybe it's Raven that lost track of the fact that Amber Heard had previously been in hot water for alleged violence against her then-girlfriend. Officer Beverly Leonard, who arrested Amber at an airport where she supposedly struck photographer Tasia Bonri, was called out by the latter for seeming to be homophobic and expressed misogynistic attitudes. Leonard later responded to the accusation on Facebook saying that she is neither of the above and the reason she arrested Amber was because she was a witness of the incident. The officer herself is a lesbian so it couldn't be accurate to claim homophobia was her motive. The situation was kept under wraps until 2016 while her divorce from Johnny was underway. Amber's rape allegation against Johnny Depp is something I want to talk about because it was a polarizing incident in the relationship that took place in Australia on March 8, 2015. What was significant about it was on the same night, he lost the tip of his finger. During the 2022 trial, while Amber Heard was on the stand, she went into graphic detail about how Johnny allegedly violently attacked her. She emotionally, emotionally stated that he shoved her against a fridge and held her by her throat. She slapped him across his face to get him to let go of her and she barricaded the room she was in. She needed to force herself to stay awake so she would hear Johnny if he tried to get in through another door. She was given medication before the couple's arrival to Australia to treat her anxiety and insomnia by Johnny's doctor, David Kipper who is also her doctor because it wouldn't be ethical to provide medicine to someone who isn't his patient. But none of them worked. The stress she was under was so severe that she would be woken up by panic attacks. She did get a bit of sleep when she realized Johnny wasn't coming for her, but he didn't get any. After waking up and finding out that Johnny had not slept, she was confronted with two accusations that she was sleeping around with a couple of her male co-stars and disliking his sister. Amber hastily denied both claims, and Johnny had taken a large handful of MDMA pills while they continued to argue. Amber testified she didn't count how many, but she believed there were 8 to 10 after he scarfed them down. Amber continued her side of the story in Australia to say that Johnny was on the phone with a few people, including his agent. She was screaming to them that he was hemorrhaging money because the studio producing Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, had ripped, them, ripped him off. He then proceeded to fire Amber's divorce attorney when he either found out about or was reminded that he would, she was going to arrange a post -nup. 
It can't be good for someone to OD on MDMA nor say to a divorce attorney that death is the only solution, but Johnny was obviously under more stress than he can handle. It was starting to affect his performance during filming of the fifth installment. Sources have reported that he repeatedly showed up late on set. Background actors were forced to stick around for hours and filming was delayed. They couldn't start without Johnny, so someone that worked on the production team was sent to the compound he was staying in and reports to the line producer when exactly he'd be up in the morning. This person was hiding in a parked car, so Johnny wasn't aware he was being watched. When he did arrive, though, he was humble to his castmates and the film crew. He wasn't nasty to them or anything. He was still a nice guy who's like a yin and yang, according to a source. The disruption his tardiness had caused got Johnny's then manager and Deadman Tell No Tales producer into an argument who's going to have a stern talking to about his behavior. The latter said the argument never happened. He basically debunked that, but he was still concerned for Johnny's well-being, and it's not just because of his arguments with Amber. He was also suing his former managers for fraud mismanagement, which lines up with the phone call part of the story she was telling on the stand. Camille Vasquez, while not visible on camera, repeatedly said, objection hearsay, but Judge Penny Ascaret kept overruling but sustained a few that didn't provide much context. Nevertheless, Amber was allowed to continue telling her side of the Australia essay incident. Johnny Depp was also talking to someone else, and he looked like he wasn't interested in listening to the testimony, but more on that in a little while. Amber Heard stated on the night slither of his finger had been severed, they had another violent row that led to Johnny throwing empty glass bottles and soda cans at her and told her he'd carve up her face. He tore off her nightgown once he had her up against the wall. She was struggling to get her footing because there was glass in the floor everywhere. Johnny punched the wall next to her head continuously, screaming that he hated her and she ruined his life. He then got on top of her, continuously screaming the same phrase, and restrained her by the neck on the countertop. She tried to get off in order to breathe, and she tried to loosen his grip on her, but it was no use. She saw Johnny's arm moving behind her, so it looked like he was punching her, but that was what she thought in that moment. She tearfully stated that Johnny had aid her with a broken liquor bottle he had in his hand. What happened to Johnny's finger, according to Amber? She said that she was cocked out when it was severed because hours went by since that fight. After she came to and got herself cleaned, she found Johnny in his study with his hand wrapped in bandana rags. He unwrapped them to show her the injured finger and said something like, Look what you made me do. The sight of him holding it up took her by surprise before she realized he was using it to paint the mirrors on the walls around the house. Amber was unsure if either her or Johnny Depp called Jerry Judge his late bodyguard, but while he was on his way, she went to make him coffee to help him sober up. When she brought it to him, he threw the mug at a television screen and screamed at her a third time. Judge and the security team arrived immediately to assess the vandalism. Johnny continued to act up in a drunken state, but not before he was dragged away. Amber was taken to a theater room where a nurse, Debbie Lloyd, offered her medication, who was also Amber's nurse because she wouldn't offer her medication otherwise, but she tearfully refused because she wasn't sure if Johnny was going to be alright, nor does she know how much the nurse was going to give her if she accepted. Amber did take a quarter of the medication offered in her room shortly after the conversation and got some rest before waking up to look for her phone. Again, I should stress that the details in Amber's story are all alleged, so don't quote me on it. I can relate to being forced to recall a traumatic memory, however, especially one where I would feel bad about myself, wish I wouldn't think about it, or rue that something had happened. I emphasize with how Amber could have been feeling when she broke down during her testimony, but house manager Ben King and Debbie Lloyd weren't sure if she sustained the injuries she described. How a part of Johnny's finger was chopped off remains unknown and whether Johnny's accusation that Amber throwing a vodka bottle at him was entirely concrete, but medical staff that treated him didn't rule out that possibility. Lloyd in particular testified a month before Amber gave her side of the story during the 2022 trial that she recalled hearing conflicting stories from different people so she was just as clueless as we are. Lloyd went on to state that she once caught Johnny Depp with bloody knuckles after he punched a whiteboard as a reaction to a fight he had with Amber Heard. Additionally, she said that at their lowest points, 
He was going from room to room trying to remove himself from a situation and she would just follow him from room to room and not give him his space. You got the tapes, let me hear them. Send me the fucking recordings. Just, just text them to me. Um, I don't know how else to say I will to you. I haven't because we have not been well. We have not been good. When I fucking move out, if I move out, then you fu I'll have a, you'll have them and you can fucking relish them. You won't fucking like it, what you hear. Won't make you happy. But you'll hear what I'm telling you. That was after Toronto. Yeah, that, that's when we came back here. I know where Toronto, we were. Toronto, Boston, here. I know where we were. We've been on the road basically since Australia, and I have been at your side. And I have not been filming the movie. Well, we were on our honeymoon. I hope you were at my side. I'm not talking about just a honeymoon. Now, am I? I'm talking about many months. And was it all the honeymoon? No. I have been at your side throughout it all. You said, why did you come to Rio? And I answered you. I would love for it to be better. I have no fucking consistency, no safety, no security. The relationship is something, me, is something you don't fight for, you don't stand up for, you always run from when it's tough. I, I'm telling you, I need more, I need, we didn't say vows, you didn't make them exactly in the same, in that, in that way, you know, but, but now is a fucking time. I need to know if you're going to be there. I want promises. I told you that at the beginning of this conversation. I need promises that you're going to fucking be there. I need promises that this is important to you. Not when it's easy. When it's hard, too. Yeah, this is something you'll fight for. That this is something that's sacred. That neither of us throw out every fight. I can't be the only one to hold the promises. I was in Toronto and it fucked me over. I can't be the only one. You can't be the only one. If I split on you, all those times that I thought about doing it, we would not be here. And I stayed, and it's tougher. You know, that's stronger. I'm stronger. It is easy to run. It is easy to run away from problems. It is easy to take that out and say, well, that's the easiest. That, I mean, that's the best, safest. That's the safest way out. I'm not saying we should get in physical altercations. I never want to be in that. Never. But every time you don't like what I say and you fucking run away, will never work out anything. You can't run away every fight. You can't. It's easy. It's, it, it's not brave. It's not strong. It's harder to say to somebody, I want to work this out. I want to face what I have. I want to face what you have. I want to work it out with you. You're not working it out. You're running away, and then you make me be the bigger person every single time and come to you and knock on the door and come to this house and say, hey, we're married, it's supposed to be sacred, calm I down, made calm you. down. I made you. Yes, by default, if you're never the one to do it, one of us is, and I'm the one to do it every time. It means I'm the bigger person every time. It means I have to be the strong one. It means every time I have to fight for our relationship, and you get to be not, you get to be lazy, you get to be cowardly, I don't and know what, what it is. what are you here for? What do you need me Once for? Once again, then? I am fighting for the relationship. I With a guy that you don't fucking trust or like? Why? I did not say I didn't like you. I love you. You're my favorite person in the world. I don't see how. I remember be. what I said at the beginning. I'm sorry you feel like you can't imagine it, but I said this to you at the beginning of this conversation. I said you're the, my favorite person in the whole world. If you weren't the most magnetic, shiny, beautiful, interesting, dynamic person I had ever met in my life, it would be so easy to walk away from this bratty thing that you Untrustworthy, do. Untrustworthy. Uh, um, uh, Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. I said I can't trust. I can't trust. That's not meaning you're untrustworthy. It means we've created a situation. And I'm telling you what you do to create it too. We've created a situation in which there, it, there cannot, trust can't grow. It's like, it's trampled every single time. And we need a marriage. That's why I sat down. Do you not remember me sitting down at the very beginning of this conversation and saying just that to you. Say, I know you got married for security and for safety. So did I. We did not get married because it was something that we're doing you know for because it was something we could walk away we wanted the state the foundation no i want yes i wanted to make you my wife I yes yes you. but you could just have me as your girlfriend if you didn't want the foundation and you told me and maybe you go back on it now fine okay cool lie about that i don't know you told me you wanted a foundation you told me you wanted the security you wanted the safety you liked the foundation at the beginning you said i really like having that it of feels course. safe so of don't argue course. with me when i say it now i'm not arguing with you Oh, yeah, but you had to pick it apart. 
by saying because I loved you and you're my wife, I wanted you to be my wife, that's picking it apart? No. Then how did I pick it apart? No, I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to fight about a fight. I want to fight about the semantics. I want to how come when I come up with a point you can't answer it? You don't want, or suddenly you don't want to answer it. What am I not answering? Because I don't want to fight about this new thing. No, I don't want to. I, I said you wanted the safety and security, and you stopped me. You interrupted me, and then you said what? Because I we, 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 no, because I wanted to have you as I my. I didn't interrupt you. You asked me, right? You said right. I meant you interjected. I meant you said. You said. How about that? See now, is this better? I answered you. I addressed what you're saying. Now, can we please not fight about that? And I said, because I love you. He said, loved. Oh. Well, we're talking about a fucking event this past tense. If I used loved, I, I, my apologies, it doesn't mean I don't love you now. Similarly, whenever they had a fight, like in Amber's penthouse, for instance, she would not leave Johnny alone. She would trap him in the same space she was in and start these arguments to get a rise out of him. That's what my ex did when we had that fight in September when I was already having a horrible day at work and he kept roping me into it. He was upset we weren't communicating as much and that we should re-examine our relationship. I wasn't in the mood to talk about it right away and thinking he might go berserk if I waited until I took a breather, I got caught up in the moment. I wasn't thinking straight. I told him to bear with me. I was still having problems from work, my personal projects, and feeling like I would be sacrificing my sleep in order to spend time with him. I was under a lot of stress. It was getting to me and my ex wasn't understanding. He wasn't giving me a choice to walk away and instead told me, anyone else would have broken up with you ages ago so you have some real gall telling me I need to be patient to accommodate you. Everything is you. 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 Like you're the only guy on planet earth with a lot of shit on his plate. It was suffocating to read and I felt like throwing my phone in the trash bin but I thankfully did not give in to that urge. I know, I've al I know I've shared it already in my first video about a relationship and narcissistic abuse, but I still feel helpless when I look back on it. It allowed me to grasp what Johnny Depp was going through and Amber Heard was keeping him isolated. Lloyd clarified that although they argued with each other, she didn't see any fight leading to anything physical in nature. It didn't mean they never had fights that escalated to physical violence, but her testimony in the absence of images of Amber's injuries poked a handful of holes in her side of the story. She could have used them as easy evidence to solidify her story and have Johnny locked up. Ben King said the day after the incident where the top of Johnny's finger was severed on March 9th, he volunteered to accompany Amber on her flight back to Los Angeles, and although she alleged she was violently essayed, he noticed that she had sustained no visible injuries. It could explain why they were photographed. King added that Amber asked him if he had ever been so angry with someone that he lost it with them. She was distrustful of him when he answered no, and they didn't speak for the rest of the flight. It's not necessarily an incriminating question for a survivor to ask because abuse changes survivors. They become fearful of other people if they unintentionally exhibit similar behavior. It re-triggers the trauma that was rooted to this behavior so they act aggressively in order to get away from it, even if it means they've hurt an innocent person. I've had a small dog bark at me when I tried to pet her at work. I don't know what she's been through. I never asked, but I knew to back off when her owner told me she was a rescue pet. Maybe Ben King can't relate to flipping out on a partner because he's never had that happen to him. But the question itself, when it is connected to the audio recordings, is alarming. When he, what he states next, though, makes Amber's Heard's question less sympathetic from there. Shortly after she and King both returned to Australia later on, the latter witnessed several more arguments where Amber behaved like a spoiled teenager and spoke angrily to Johnny Depp. He tried to leave the room where he was provoked, but she wouldn't leave him alone. Johnny Depp described her as someone that has a need for conflict. She has a need for violence. It erupts out of nowhere. She, cra she craved the need to assert power over him. Power she never had as a little girl that watched her father, David Clinton Heard, beat her late mother and experienced who knows what because little is known about her family life. He is a notoriously violent man that abused substances and legal documents retrieved by the blast revealed that he threatened to kill Johnny for ruining his baby girl's career and a phone call to a mechanic but to this day, 
Amber still looks up to him. Later that year, on December 15, 2015, there was a separate explosive argument in the Los Angeles penthouse where Amber alleged Johnny Depp essayed her a subsequent time. The next day, her stylist, Samantha McMillan, hung out with Amber and she noticed that she didn't have any visible bruises and cuts. According to her, she saw Amber in good light, at close range, wearing no makeup. After her appearance on the Late Late Show with James Gordon, who is also a questionable individual, Amber went up to her excitedly and said, Can you believe I just did that show with two black eyes? McMillan was thinking to herself, Uh, what black eyes? A visit to Johnny's house in West Hollywood on May 24, 2016 aroused more suspicion from the stylist. Amber alleged that he threw a phone at her, striking her in the eye and smashing objects with a wine bottle, but like the incident before, McMillan reported that there was no such injury, though they engaged in a heart-to-heart -heart conversation where Amber hugged her and cried. Amber heard injuries, or supposed injuries for that matter, because they have no photographic proof of the Australia incident, weren't examined. She wasn't denied treatment, she went straight back to Los Angeles afterwards. You can't just walk off an injury that gruesome as easily as Amber did the following morning, not without going to an emergency room, which is why Camille Vasquez questioned Amber's integrity when she told her side of the story on the stand. To ask an abuse survivor why they didn't go to a hospital nor go to the authorities is generally inappropriate and cruel because it makes the abuse seem like they've asked for it to happen. But here, Lloyd's, McMillan's, and King's respective testimonies leaves room for doubt. It's not necessarily incriminating that Amber went through these incidents mostly unharmed, but her stories aren't coherent with these testimonies. Now that I think about how Johnny said he changed his story by his finger to protect Amber from getting in trouble, it's likely that Tasia Von Reed was also trying to cover for Amber in her statement to People Magazine about the 2009 arrest because they're both still on good terms, and she doesn't want to see her suffer. One might argue it's a miracle Amber lived, but the only injuries reported from that night were Johnny's severed finger, and Amber's consistent scratches on her forearm, indicating that she inflicted more harm on him than he did on her. We all understand that Depp fans will side with Depp, but even the less aggressively Depp piled up of us want to believe that the Caribbean pirate is blameless, if not squeaky clean, then at least under the duress of d drug addiction or acting out of character, that his violence can be somewhat explained by a lapse of judgment or circumstance of both. Hold it right there, Raven. That's the entire point. Substance abuse doesn't make anyone a bad person. I had a long-distance friend from Canada that did the same thing because he made stupid choices and he felt no one cared about him. Similarly, Irene Bedar turned to heavy drinking to cope with having been abused by her ex-husband. Her career took a hit because it was controlling of her personhood. She wanted to use her celebrity status to inspire Native Americans and raise awareness of their heritage. She was an ambitious advocate at the start of her career and continues to be, now that she has her life back. Every time her ex-husband came to visit her on set, his presence made her, the cast and crew, uncomfortable. Eventually, no director would cast her any project and Irene had bruises on her skin. It made it difficult for her to book roles and audition if her ex-husband couldn't stop her from going. It wasn't until she got the courage to leave him for the sake of her son Quinn was she able to reprise her role as Pocahontas in Ralph Breaks the Internet and land a part in the upcoming live-action remake of Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm not defending her choices nor am I defending my friend's choices. But I understand that substance abuse is how some people cope with their suffering. Johnny Depp had reoccurring problems with alcohol and substances, but since he got together with Amber Heard, like Irene Bedard in her marriage, he lost control. She shouldn't go off scot-free, all because he did this, he did that, or he took illicit substances once upon a time. They were both awful people, and I'm in no way defending their actions, but Johnny shouldn't be demonized for his addiction. By bringing it up repeatedly to make Amber Heard seem like the better person, it makes it harder for real people that turn to substances to quit. Their addiction numbs their pain, even if it kills them. I lost track of how many peers and a relative I lost to substance abuse because deep inside, they felt nobody cared about them. I tried talking my friend from Canada out of it by showing him he is loved, and it worked. When he last messaged me, he was still struggling to get sober and he said he loved me, but when I checked his Instagram recently, 
he posted photos of a fishing trip in the Canadian wilderness. He's doing much better with his life and it's because I chose to stick with him when he was still struggling. Even when he was tempted to drink, smoke, or hurt himself, he repeatedly tells me that he's happy I reached out. I felt defeated whenever he caved in or if he felt alone, but I was patient throughout his slow recovery. Treating him like someone who's broken instead of a criminal helped him change for the better. The hell my ex put me through made me forget for a while that I've had that impact on my friend and now I'm proud that I was part of his life. Alright, where was I? We certainly don't want to believe that this entire court case is a precise and convening operation in discrediting her, regardless of what she has to say, regardless of her truth. Hang on. Is it her truth, or is it the truth? Huge difference there. I don't want to think about what this is saying to victims of abuse who are considering coming forward, and regardless of what her did or didn't suffer at the hands of death, isn't the relentless memeing of her a form of violence in itself? Note the front page of this edition of the New York Post. Is the pummeling by social media not a type of psychological assault? Are we not witnessing a modern-day witch trial? We are indeed witnessing a modern-day witch trial, but not for the reason Raven is implying. The tweets on my right that's part of an interaction a Dr. Kennedy had with Mage prior to her second suspension, and another from a law firm employee stating they are anonymous on Twitter to avoid vitriol from Johnny's fans, echoes the sentiment in this question. I agree that celebrity worship can easily fog someone's judgment that's not up for debate, but it ignores how fans of Amber Heard have put her on such a high pedestal that she is hailed as an icon who's suffering on the behalf of all women, more specifically bisexual women, like since when? I can't put my finger on it. It has made every victim of abuse in the demographic feel scorned because outsiders now have another reason to ignore them or invalidate their suffering. But just because someone lied about their abuse doesn't give us permission to discredit other people's stories. Using this case as a precedent is going to be dangerous. It's particularly appalling that fans of both actors are dragging Lily Rose into the situation. Her last comment was in 2016 and it was in support for her father. It has since been deleted but it's highly likely it is the last she would say about him. Lily Rose's distance from him also means she wants nothing to do with the case. She's posted six captions on Instagram since the trial had taken place, promoting an upcoming HBO Max drama series where she portrays a pop idol that gets mixed up with a self-help guru. She seems to be throwing herself into her career, so to comment on her Instagram page about her father is like beating one dead horse after another. A lot of Amber Heard's fans can't accept that there are some people that choose to side with neither of them nor get involved at all because they say they're both horrible in their own way. An online friend has stayed as far away from the trial as she could for that reason. Another person has said that they've seen too much abuse in their life to even pick a side and I can totally understand and respect that. Most people that side with Johnny Depp aren't his biggest fans, myself included because I've only seen him in five movies and one Spongebob episode, but those that were reminded of their abusers when they read about Amber's behavior and heard it for themselves in recordings of her belittling her ex-husband. Big shout out to Incredibly Average for compiling and documenting the recordings and making comments about him based on what we've heard. Stans have assumed the lingering trauma from these relationships made them more susceptible to manipulation. Surviving and living through domestic abuse may not make us an expert on a universal level, but we know how to pick up on behavior cues that can get us to claim that something is amiss. The following slide contains screenshots of a few tweets from one with a rudimentary understanding of how victims deal with their suffering and projected it onto me. <clears throat> A counselor who came in during the death throes of the marriage when Amber started defending herself. <laughs> you wish. I do wish you would educate yourself on what domestic violence is and what it looks like. Speaks for yourself. Depp has no recollection of specific abuse incident incidents. Heard has over a dozen. Of course the abuser would be calm in a session and the victim would be erratic because they are the ones living with being traumatized daily. Mutual abuse is also not a thing. You were darvoed by him. Ugh. It's his text that was submitted to the courts. It's quite clear what he meant. You are in a cult, and I hope you seek help for deprogramming. How is this not ableist? 
I have nothing more to say. Good. Johnny Depp was under a lot of stress because of the pain and isolation that Amber Heard put him through. Of course he'd had violent thoughts about her and lash out at someone when it became too much for him. I vent to friends when I have no other way to deal with stress. That can easily be misinterpreted as, You're being mean. You're being sarcastic. You don't need to yell. And if I'm not allowed to explain myself, the stress starts to get worse. I found an article Unilad put a link to on Facebook where the headline stated that a series of text messages Johnny sent to Paul Bettany were presented to the court in Virginia. They were horrific and I couldn't believe Johnny would text these things if he is a victim of abuse. But we still need to get to the bottom of why he would call Amber and her friends vulgar names and why he would want her dead. An abuse survivor that sympathized with Johnny in the comments also had violent thoughts toward her abuser and feared these could be used against her, rightfully so. The replies she got were supportive. being told to educate myself about what domestic abuse is and what it looks like in a thread of egotistical, ableist tweets that look the other way when I opened up about my experience is obviously lost on this woman. Not every story about surviving abuse is the same and to have our own where we are forced to take the abuse diminished right in front of us feels like we are worth nothing. Survivors have different ways of coping with trauma and being forced to relive it is torture to a broken mind. This ravenous Stan also said an abuser would remain calm during a session, but she neglected to specify why Johnny would be mute during whatever sessions he had with his marriage counselor and throughout the trial because the way psychology works is that there's always one facet or person that's different from the rest, which is a detail she doesn't know shit about. Some abusive people, namely narcissistic abusers, are quiet or can't act surprised when their victims call them out. They would use their silence to fabricate an explanation for their behavior to make their victims seem crazy. But with Johnny Depp, it's a different situation. He's no stranger to prolonged exposure to abuse. He lived through it along with his three siblings at the hands of his late mother, Betty Sue Palmer. Johnny testified during the defamation trial that she allegedly threw an ashtray, a high-heeled shoe, and a telephone. His father was on the receiving end of most of the abuse. He was described as a kind, quiet man that stood there and took it while Betty beat him in front of a five-year-old Johnny and his siblings. Not once did he fight back, nor lay a finger on her. Johnny Depp is accustomed to enduring abuse, but it doesn't mean he has to tolerate reliving it through Amber Heard. A YouTuber mentioned in a video about the aftermath of the 2022 defamation trial that certain aspects of behavior from abuse survivors can be mistaken as lunacy in a trial, and that's what compelled some of their viewers to side with Amber Heard. It gave me some thinking to do because that YouTuber made an excellent point about it, and I concluded the same argument could be made about Johnny's own eccentric behavior. He retreated into his head, praying for these sessions to be over. He believed he was still in danger because just by listening to anyone present talk about these incidents, he feels he cannot escape what Amber put him through. It reminds me of a scene in Disney's 1950 animated adaptation of Cinderella where the protagonist's stepsisters tore up her dress like a pack of wolves devouring fresh meat. After all, we did make a bargain, didn't we, Cinderella? And I never go back on my word. How very clever. These beads, they give it just the right touch. Don't you think so, Drizella? No, I don't. I think she's... Oh, why, you little thief! They're my beads! Give them here! Oh, no! Oh, and look, that's my sash wearing my sash. He can't! Oh, 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 please, oh, 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 Girls, girls. That's quite enough. Hurry along now, both of you. I won't have you upsetting yourselves.
Good night. <gasps> When I made my first video about narcissistic abuse, I showed you a clip of that scene to give an example of what it must feel like to talk about narcissistic abuse, only to be called an ableist by using the term when you yourself are an ableist by shaming survivors for opening up about their abuse because of the long-term damage that kind of abuse has on their mental health. It's appropriate that I did this again because of the parallels between Cinderella's inability to fight back against her stepfamily and Johnny Depp trying to avoid eye contact while Amber Heard was on the stand. A lot of people that don't buy Amber's allegations, myself included, are accustomed to getting flamed by her fervent fans. I mentioned previously how one stand that later got suspended from Twitter, Armchair diagnosed Johnny Depp's entire fan base with attention deficit disorder, and another using her fabricated credentials as a science professor as a free pass to sneer at fellow abuse survivors. A few people asked for proof of her credentials, but her only answer was something like, I'm a professor that's written a lot of papers about domestic abuse and won multiple awards. Please, read any of my many posts before saying the same ignorant thing as everyone. I'm pretty well done with it. Hell no, lady. You're not a professor, and you know it. Their tweets are just dirt on our shoulders, but when it follows us off the web, it can become virtually hopeless to put a stop to it. Their compulsion to be Amber's white knights has wrought real-life consequences on their victims. A group of them doxed a YouTuber called The Umbrella Guy for covering Amber Heard extensively on his channel, and once they figured out he has a family, they sent child services after him. He has sued a member of Amber's legal team for their potential involvement in submitting a false police report. Another Twitter user has created a hit list of high-profile YouTubers to publicly shame and encourage her fellow groupies to cyberbully them for speaking out against Amber's lying. She went as far as to say they don't deserve their platforms. It parallels alarming accounts of stands willing to tear Britney Spears and Rihanna, both women who endured physical and psychological violence, and more recently Jamie Lee Curtis, to shreds. Controversial Stanford Law School professor Michelle Duber hoped Rihanna would be thrown in a trash can and be eaten by rats alongside Johnny Depp. Whether it's a suspected death threat or simply someone venting, it's baffling that the university has allowed Professor Dauber to keep her position. Addressing the act as a Kentucky funeral is also messed up because of the racist implications behind it. Fried chicken has historically been associated as a source of dignity with African Americans. They were robbed of it when Caucasian inventors took credit for their contribution to the food industry in the South. And taking into consideration that Rihanna is a woman of color, it solidifies the idea that Professor Dauber is aware that her opinion is racist. But she felt the need to tweet it anyway because like Mage wishing dementia on Johnny Depp, she perceives him as so undeserving of humanity that he and people that associate with him should die like an animal. Multiple small business owners on Etsy are more vulnerable to this anomalous backlash. Sellers that have seen an increase in sales on homemade Johnny Depp themed merchandise in their shops have been targeted by calls for Etsy to take them down. Undeniably, there were an abundant amount of products I found when I typed Amber Heard in the search bar that were in poor taste. A few made doormats that took a page out of the Starbucks tip jar, some made holiday cards using Amber's surname as a pun, and some had made caricatures of her that made light of the defecation incident, which again, I don't condone. As a customer that has supported artists on the platform, it's not equitable to single out those that have simply made fan art of Johnny Depp to show their support. They aren't intentionally capitalizing on the trial, nor are chippy artists like Witchy Unicorn making fun of Amber. I showed you these situations to highlight from spectating and personal experience that although some major fans of Johnny Depp paint him as an idol that can do no wrong, those on social media that defend Amber Heard are just as prone to getting entangled in one-sided friendships with her to the point where they're willing to endanger and disregard lives. Amber Heard is not at fault for how her fans conduct themselves in these spaces and shouldn't be used to reflect her as a person unless they openly encourage it Public figures are never responsible for what their fans do at the end of the day, but Raven's coverage of reactions to the defamation trial isn't faithful to the narrative I've come across with my own eyes because it was exclusively covering reactions coming from Johnny Depp's fandom. 
This witch hunt has not just targeted one public figure, but multiple artists, professionals, and families. It's either believe a liar because you can't be a feminist if you don't, or burn as a traitor for speaking out against them. I picked my poison this time last year when I said May should have left survivors of narcissistic abuse alone and stopped posting in spaces where they're reaching out for support. Luckily, I refused to give in to peer pressure from her mutual friend, nor did I let that poison kill me. It took being friends with another narcissist that got his psychology professor can to realize that I didn't lose anything important. Some weeks, the internet is buoyant. All of us kept afloat by daft dresses and Kardashian weddings and Marvel actors saying they've never been in the same room. Other weeks, it just feels too heavy. We're watching people actively seek out humor in domestic abuse as Roe vs. Wade is terrorized by pro-lifers and as we see yet more episodes of racially aggravated violence. We'll rally, we always rally, but right here, right now, it feels like shit. I spent a lot of time wondering if everyone's lost the plot, if the erosion of empathy we see online has rendered us so inherently unkind as a species that there's no return. I don't want to despair for humanity, Dr. Paul Bloom already has, probably, but he said there's nothing against empathy. I want to believe that some of us are offline and mildly compassionate, or compassionate in a way that doesn't get tweeted about, that you're all out there being nice to each other and I'm reporting on a tiny cluster of internet user users with pitchforks. Though I felt myself fearing toward it, I can no longer both sides this. It's time to draw a line. It's time to believe women. All women. It's time to believe her. The British courts believe that be his ex-wife. What's stopping the rest of us? Go ask the psychologists. Seriously though, go ask the marriage counselor and she'll tell you that Amber Heard instigated most of her fights with Johnny Depp. In the passage to my right, clinical psychologist Laura Anderson testified a few days into the defamation trial that it was a point in pride to Amber, if she felt disrespected, to initiate a fight. Her father had beaten her. She went on to say that Amber would rather keep fighting with Johnny than see him leave her. She would strike him to ensure he stays put. The non-existence of mutual abuse and the stigma that comes with using the term is the only argument from NBC's article I agree with. It's not what I'd use to describe how both partners were vicious to each other. Reactive abuse is a better way to phrase the dynamic of Johnny's and Amber's relationship, but the term itself is still a misnomer because victims of abuse don't decide to battle their perpetrators to get back at them. Johnny was never looking for a reason to fight Amber, but she was. I don't, it's so fucking pointless and you know it to sit here and fight about fucking whatever you think happened with Trout. You just, it wasn't no. a conversation. Listen, we I was not a lie. I'm not going you to. You lied, you're an asshole. You're fucking full of shit. What lied, lie? When? Hmm? What conversation did I have with Travis? A um, big, big investigative study you've done. I'm not sitting here no, and fighting with you about the, the, the fight that we had last night. After you fucking got physically violent with me, I texted Travis. I said, come up here because I, I didn't want anything to, to happen. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's coming well, save me. No, go ahead, continue. You, 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 Travis to the rescue. No, that, no, that was the last one. You can go, uh, you go. That was the last insult. Oh, yeah. You, you, you called me a liar, and yet, yeah. Yet. I watched you lie. You called me a liar? I watched you lie. I You're heard it. I was bullshit. right there. There's no, what? You still haven't told me what lie it is. We'll talk but yet, to every single fucking time. We'll you know you Travis. do this every single fucking time. We'll talk time. to Travis. I'm not fucking talking to nobody. No, fuck that. You fucking... go fucking jerk. Go jerk him off. I don't care. I really could care less. It's you every single time. You latch onto some sort of thing. When I already told you, I don't know what you're fucking talking about. You don't even know what you're talking about. You still haven't even told me what it is. But run with it. You I have told you it. what it is. No, you haven't. I said to Travis, I said, Good. no, I said to you, hey, okay. tell Travis right. what just happened. You oh, you told me to do it. You yeah. told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, t tell him what just happened. And I lied. And that you punched me in the You're fucking right. thing and you, you in the face. Out. And you said, no, fuck it. No, I didn't. What the fuck are you talking about? And I, I watched you, you lie. And then I, I didn't punch you, and then by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, you, uh, uh, punch hit you. Me across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, even a lot of fights have been around a long time. I know. Yeah, no, no, when you fucking have a closed fist. You get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. 
I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. You can't I don't know deck what me. the boat motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are your toes? How, what am I supposed to do? Do this? How are your toes? I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's you, the difference you between me toes. and you. You're a fucking baby. Because you start you physical are fights. You're such a baby. Because Grow you, the fuck up, Because you start Tony. physical fights. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did. So I had because, to get the fuck out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. Every single time. What, 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 what's your excuse when there's not a physical fight? Then what's the excuse there? You're still being admirable, right? Just by running away. And you can sit here and, and call me names, but you get called the name, and what do you do? That's the last insult. You're a baby. You're a hypocrite. You don't do anything that you actually do. You expect from people what you can't give them. Just a reminder that nearly 300 feminist organizations and quote-unquote experts signed an open letter stating that they stand with this woman. I hope they're proud of themselves. There's always going to be an aggressor in an abusive relationship, and yes, it's never the victim's fault that they hurt them. That's what helped me feel a bit better about my ex telling me that I never cared about him before he OD'd. One of the last messages he sent me on Discord, You don't have to lie to me though. You never really cared, I'm sure, and I don't blame you. Who would care about me? But it doesn't matter now. Nothing does broke me because I wished I could do more to save him. I wish I could have said something different to let him know I do care, but even that wouldn't change anything in that moment. I thought that maybe he was right, but he ended up using my remorse against me when he texted me that he woke up in the ER. I replied bye and blocked him because I was at work at the time and I was at a loss for words. I didn't want to deal with it anymore. What did he think he was going to gain from calling me horrible names and telling me that no guy would want to be with me? It was already overwhelming to sink in that he could have died and he wouldn't let me tell him that I'm happy he's still alive. It was a long distance relationship but he used my feelings for him and my faith he will survive against me. I felt bitter and angry all the time after that because I believed everything he said about me was true. But my boyfriend, another friend from the LGBT community, and my video chats with Jacqueline Grazer, Tara Strong, and Laura Morano helped me remove that delusion one day at a time. Last February, GalaxyCon Live hosted a virtual meet and greet with Tara a couple days before Valentine's Day. I was thinking of a promise to make to my ex so I bought several additional minutes so I could fulfill it after all this time and vent to her about how that trauma affected me. That led us to get into a conversation about empathy. She noted that I'm an empath and she'd rather care for other people than not at all. Even though I'm still uncertain if empaths exist because there's no scientific evidence that supports it, her assessment of my personality and comparing herself to me put a smile on my face. We're both sensitive to emotions and we use it to guide us when we make decisions even if we sometimes don't give them second thoughts. It's a quality in people that we undervalue and what we see very little of. As I've seen with how people involved have reacted to the trial on Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, etc. and those siding with Amber Heard are wishing harm on Johnny Depp, it's clear that their empathy for others has been corrupted by the fallacy that we should believe all women, even if they are proven liars. If we take that advice, we should believe Carolyn Bryant, whose taught tale that Emmett Till was hitting on her at a general store, got him brutally murdered by her husband and brother-in-law. We should believe Abigail Williams, a girl that condemned three women, including her uncle's slave Tichuba, to death by claiming they bewitched her. And we should believe Sherry Papini, who was sentenced to 18 months in prison last August for faking her own kidnapping and leading authorities on a wild goose chase to find her non-existent captors. Papini described them as two Hispanic women that she said covered their faces, causing the local Hispanic community to feel singled out. The point I'm trying to make is that anyone is capable of lying. Don't believe all men. Don't believe all women either. Believe abuse victims and survivors that live to tell the tale, regardless of gender and sexual orientation. That's what's stopping me. That being said, both of Johnny Depp's and Amber Heard's psychologists testified during the defamation trial that Johnny was on the receiving end of Amber's violence. 
Dr. Don Hughes may have said that Amber inflicted violence on Johnny, but she was asked a direct question and she answered it honestly. When we listened to the phone conversations again, most notably where Amber admitted to not punching him but hitting him, the pieces fall into place. As, the, as a result of the work that you performed, did you form any opinions with respect to Ms. Hurd? I did. What were those opinions? I, uh, the results of Ms. Hurd's evaluation supported two diagnoses, borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder. So what you see when we're talking about the personality disorders is there is a very consistent pattern of the aggression, the violence, the irritability. You cannot testify that Johnny Depp was not abused, can you? I, I can testify that he had physical acts of violence perpetrated on him as well as psychological aggressive acts perpetrated upon him. No further questions. Amber Heard's Twitter profile disappeared on November 1st. I saw that coming for some time. She hasn't posted anything on social media since the jury made its verdict, and the negative coverage she received from both mainstream and social media was becoming more than she could handle. But the fact it mysteriously vanished, given her present circumstances, is concerning. We have loads to unpack from this turn of events. Currently, Amber is in debt. Her attorney stated that she cannot afford the $10 million in damages she owes Johnny Depp, and she owes an additional $6 million in legal fees. Johnny Depp may not care much for the money, according to attorney Benjamin Chu, but he's still entitled to that compensation. Amber's mistrial request was also denied by Judge Askerite in July, and her insurance companies are suing her so they wouldn't have to cover her fees. At the time of this recording, Amber has filed a countersuit against them. Her debt is reportedly so severe that a luxury house in Yucca Valley owned by a mysterious trust account linked to her was sold to a Las Vegas-based insurance entrepreneur and his wife a month later. Some people on Twitter have speculated that Amber has fled the country based on part of a court document that's listed her as stateless for a while and she wasn't cited in the United States since the defamation trial ended. I don't believe this is a permanent change. Her vacation in Spain might be just a way for her to detox from the stress she's been under and is looking for new living arrangements. Once again, Catherine Lozano and Andrea Burkhardt have videos on their channels where they eloquently broke down these documents to predict if Amber's insurance company is liable to pay her legal fees regardless of its refusal to help her and that being stateless is a valid legal defense. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for Amber Heard to deactivate her account to prevent investigators from looking into it. Social media companies are required by law to hold on to posts and DMs even when they're deleted in case a court needs to subpoena them. Discord is held to that standard and from what I understand, so is Twitter. Who knows what Amber could have been talking to but focusing on her private life means we're missing the issue here? I don't know. One other detail about the state of Amber's account that has gotten people asking questions was that it was gone a few days after Elon Musk purchased Twitter and was appointed as its CEO. It's too coincidental, but what is interesting about the timing is that he and Amber Heard were an item shortly after her divorce from Johnny was finalized in 2016. They split up after about a year of dating and a month of giving it another chance, but they have since remained good friends. Their past relationship and Amber Heard's decision to delete her account aren't related. What is related, however, is that Twitter has become more right-wing friendly since Elon Musk's takeover and Amber was most likely scared that now that he has allowed MAGA extremists to tweet harmful, deceptive content on the site without consequence, mockeries of her are going to get worse. Negative coverage of her has gotten so explosive that she is unable to function as a human being, as I've mentioned. That's probably why Raven Smith asked in his article for Vogue if we are witnessing a modern-day witch trial, come to think of it. It is possible Amber Heard deleted her account so she wouldn't see what people and the media are saying about her and her vacations. It is the only rational conclusion I can reach as of right now, and a friend from work I spoke with about it was on the same page. Her Instagram handle, though, remains active. 
I believe Amber Heard genuinely believes what she's been telling her loved ones, her lawyers, and the courts is true. That doesn't mean they are. She doesn't strike to me as someone who would knowingly lie. Johnny Depp had likely behaved in a way that appeared innocent, but it triggered a traumatic memory in Amber's life, and that was why she reacted violently toward him. She always deduced that the worst was going to happen because of the PTSD linked to her abusive childhood. Her impulsive behavior, like striking Johnny, belittling him by openly telling him he will die a lonely old man, and exaggerating her injuries, are likely survival tactics to save herself from getting hurt again. I'm not defending any of that, but it's the reason why she heavily reminds me of my ex and why I don't see Amber Heard as a narcissist. The main antagonist of Alice Madness Returns with similar behavioral traits to both people is Dr. Angus Bumby, a therapist overseeing an orphanage in Victoria era London that turned out to be a pimp that sold children into trafficking. When Alice discovered that he was the true cause of the infamous fire that killed her family and that he essayed her older sister, she confronted Dr. Bumby in a newly constructed train station. He laughed off the allegations as if she was telling a joke. The imbalance in the relationship made it perfectly clear Alice wouldn't be believed by the public, much like how male victims are rarely taken seriously. In his twisted head, Dr. Bumby legitimately believed he can do no wrong and that his actions benefit society at large, causing some people to, sus to suspect he himself may have a mental disorder. American Mickey stated that he will not divulge into his backstory because such a character is undeserving of humanity and he doesn't want players to feel sorry for him, according to this blogger on Tumblr that quoted the developer. Along with understanding Amber Heard's actions, got me to realize that it is of great importance to raise awareness of red flags in the most subtle cases of domestic violence, rescue victims of any age from these situations, and break the cycle of abuse. I've talked about in my last video about the case and my reaction to Mage's video about how I made a friend on Reddit with a condition that was bullied by a guy his ex-girlfriend became friends with. Since I uploaded that video, I found another story of the NPD subreddit posted by a college student that was kicked out of his psychology class for speaking out against his professor because he prodigally badmouthed his diagnosis during a lecture. He admitted to having narcissistic personality disorder, causing the professor to scold him. He hollered that people like him were ruining his class and demanded him to leave. The student said something like, Fuck that, I'm out. A few of his classmates thought he was a complete asshole for treating him like that, so he wasn't discouraged. He reported the incident to the university for alleged discrimination. They investigated for a few days, and it resulted in the professor getting sacked from his post. Hopefully, he won't be teaching at another university, and that he was blacklisted from applying for another job, because that was horrible. An interim teacher was appointed, allowing the student to return to the psychology class, so this story has a happy ending. My bond with the student from his perspective got me to take a second look at my first video about narcissistic abuse. There, I mentioned that my ex has his own YouTube channel. Shortly before our breakup, he uploaded a video where he talks about a time he went to a concert where a singer he looked up to performed and was invited onto our tour bus. He told me about it beforehand and I shared his disappointment because he had a great night, but I didn't know he shared our personal email addresses on camera until I saw the video. I'm not going to show it to you because I don't want to give him any attention. I'm not going to name the singer he met either because she's an abuse survivor herself and gets cyberbullied all the time, so I don't want to feed into that. 
still, I want to revisit that section to expand on why what I make of my ex's behavior is much more ominous than how I originally interpreted it, and take back what I said about it possibly being generally, generally linked to narcissistic personality disorder. My knowledge of it has grown since I became close friends with this dude, so I want to clarify that the symptoms of the disorder and abandonment issues don't 100% converge, though they can in some people with borderline personality disorder. My ex has my phone number and my address, which I never, ever give out online for my own safety, but only did because he wanted to mail me a framed painting he made along with a Hallmark card for my birthday. I was relieved at the time because I trusted him and it was a sweet gesture. After watching the video where he docks the singer near the end, my heart sank because I'm terrified of what could happen when or if he does the same thing when he talks about me. He hasn't uploaded a new video since we split up, but I dread that he'll one day upload a surprise video to talk about our breakup and use it to drag me down in the mud. Amber Heard did that to Johnny Depp in her article for the Washington Post, and it's a common tactic for abusers, specifically those that are narcissists, to get their side of the story out there to paint their victims as wacky. It's a way to keep them from leaving these relationships, nor be completely rid of them once they're over. I know this makes me sound paranoid, and believe me, I continuously pray this never happens. But in this, his video, my ex said, I'm trying not to call her, call her out on her name right now because I'm not like that. I don't like talking about women like that. He said repeatedly he's not like that, and I believed him, yet he does it anyway in the same entitled, angry, conceited tone as his text messages and his voicemails. That's how gaslighting works. It's not a reason to be dismissive of other abuse survivors, nor does it justify demonizing mental illness, and that's what I'm going to get to right now. Does this singer still use the email addresses my ex displayed on camera? How should I know? We don't for sure unless we contact her ourselves, but it's still not a wise decision to post someone's personal information to get even with them for ghosting you. I sent the student I befriended screenshots of messages where he lost it. I told him about the voicemails he left to me. While he said that my ex probably isn't a narcissist, he recognized it's not for him to judge because he doesn't know him personally, and he knew his behavior was toxic. It was during that conversation where he surprisingly showed compassionate empathy for me. He still craves admiration and take, takes pride in his appearance he wants to get into modeling, but he put my pain before his own to be supportive and views me as one of the only true friends he has. That helped me heal from my relationship a lot more. I still believe that my ex has some traits of narcissism such as his disregard for others, his entitlement to, for, to a long-term friendship with a singer that ghosted him, his jealousy of my artist friend, and not showing any empathy when I needed to back away from the fight we had when he said anyone else would have broken up with you ages ago. It does not make up a bulk of his personality, nor is NPD his diagnosis. What he struggles with, though, are abandonment issues and an eating disorder. He played with my feelings because he was scared I wouldn't be interested in him anymore. It shouldn't just justify what he had done to me, but I still believe he should have gotten help so he could find another way to manage his issues. Depression had punched me in the groin yet again while recording this video, but thank you so much for sticking around. I now realize that whenever I talk about my abuse, I go back to hating myself and wonder why I couldn't leave when I had the power to end it during the last two months I was with my ex. It hasn't stopped me from being brave and trying to anyway in the hope that it will help someone watching this feel less alone. If that's you, you are not what your abuser says you are. You know yourself better than anyone. I will end this video with a few song recommendations. One is a recent single by Ellie Goulding that came out on October 19th called Let It Die. The no-nonsense, brutally honest meaning behind it that Ellie has posted on her Facebook page hit a nerve because the intensity and urgency to enter a relationship too soon was exactly what happened between me and my ex. He gave too much to me and spent very little time taking care of himself even after I told him to. Likewise, since he broke down in a phone call over his jealousy of a close friend, I didn't have the same feelings for him I had when we met because I was scared that this was going to happen again. Looking back, part of the reason I communicated with him less was because I didn't want to say anything that might set him off, but I should have known that our breakup was inevitable. 
If I didn't hold back and tell him, it's over, then I'd have some dignity left. I should have just ended the relationship that night and key lines and let it die such as, When did you lose the light behind your eyes? I gave too much. You sucked the life out of me. And I won't go back. Spinning around under your spell brought back that painful memory. The song was still graspable because it felt like Ellie Golding wrote it specifically about a relationship. It was a year-long no-win situation. Either of my choices, even if I think I made the right one, would have fractured it. He was jealous of my close friendship with my artist friend, so of course I've had to tell him everything my ex took out on me, including that anyone else would have broken up with you ages ago bullcrap as a precaution. His response was the same as the message Ellie conveyed and let it die. Only at the time, I was weak willed to cut the rope and took the love bombing that followed through the next few days. Coincidentally, a friend that was in a bad relationship inspired Ellie to write the song. She told Apple Music in an interview that I needed to get something off my chest. It was causing both of them pain. It was toxic. That's why I'm pretty savage with the lyrics in the song. You know when you get to that point, you just gotta... Life's too short. You gotta just let it go. The coal never bothered me anyway. She was looking out for her friend. She cared about this person so deeply that she wrote the song as a way of saying, This relationship isn't good for you. You need to leave now. Don't look back. The song has been released, but you have the option to pre-order physical and digital copies of the album. It'll be out next February. It's the first time I've heard Ellie release anything new since I was in my early 20s. I'm not a huge fan, but I occasionally see her name in articles, and I'm excited to see how far she has come with her otherworldly style in her pop music. Other songs I recommend are All Too Well, 10 Minute Version, Would Have, Could Have, Should Have, and Anti Hero, all that were written and performed by Taylor Swift in the past two years. I can't stress enough that she is a songwriting genius and is an inspiration to fellow Swifties that struggle with poor mental health. Anti Hero captures Taylor's insecurities in intricate detail in coping with feeling less than human in the public eye. She's written songs about her anxiety and being painted as a villain by the public before, but Antihero sticks out because she doesn't sugarcoat how the scrutiny she's been under for her dating life and body image affected her. She said herself the song is like a guided tour into her self-loathing. The accompanying music video accurately embodies the representation she was shooting for. The scene where she crawled into a dining room as a giant and scared away the onlooking at the onlookers at the table was thought-provoking. The self-blame that's striking in the following line, It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, I'm the problem, it's me, at tea time, everybody agrees, got me emotional because it's an issue that I struggle with since to about 2013. I often have a dreaded feeling that if something happened that's out of my hands, it's entirely my fault and I mentally fall apart. Anti-hero, would've, could've, should've, and all too well, 10 minute version contains imagery centered around loss of dignity after a failed relationship, feeling alone when someone weaponizes your shortcomings to feel better about themselves, and uncertainty with deciding how to move on. My ex put me through all of the above. That's what made it difficult for me to find a resolution from that relationship. I still wonder how it would have been different if I went with my gut and ended it that July after his jealousy of my artist friend. Would the consequences have been worse? Would we start over as friends and only friends? Whatever would have happened, it's something I should have done and it's my only regret. I debated including I Forgot You Existed in my song recommendations, but I realized that I had a literal interpretation of the song when I listened to it the first few times. After I received the two harassing voicemails from my ex last September, it was like I never left that relationship. That's why I now panicked when I took a closer look at the time my ex doxed the singer who ghosted him. As long as he has my contact information, he'll find some way to continue hurting me if, she, if he chooses to. I forgot that you existed is more about detaching myself from the past, so while I can't forget my ex entirely, my memories of him no longer bother me as much as they used to. I have people I'm close with in my life that know who I am better than he does, so there's no need to base my self-worth off of proving him wrong. 
I forgot that you existed isn't the best song I'd immediately listen to in order to get over narcissistic abuse, but it gets an honorable mention for the lack of emotion in the last few lines in the chorus. What the three songs I recommended have in common is that survivors can never truly heal from the trauma caused by bad relationships, and that's alright. The scars may be long-lasting, but with support from friends you can count on and understanding your abuser's problems are not your fault, your suffering can be transformed into your greatest strength. Let me know what you think down below, and I'll get cracking on reading Miss Memory Lane, in addition to other projects for my game series I need to catch up on. Godspeed.